Sanders. Fascinating discussion. I would urge all of you to keep a, a pen or a pencil and paper handy and write some of these names down if you're not familiar with them. Walter Lippmann, Edward L. Bernays, B-E-R-N-A-Y-S, the uh, nephew of Sigmund Freud. You need to understand that. And then when you go out and you look today at our younger people, remember what Neil said and what I've been saying for a long time about herd and hive, and I have never seen such pressure. And now when you see young people holding their mobile devices, it literally in their hands all the time. They can't even put them in their pockets anymore. They hold them in their hand and keep looking at them every 10 or 15 seconds to see if they've gotten a message, almost in order to validate their self-worth. It's, it's really scary to watch. iPhones, smartphones, Android phones, iPod, iPad, you name it. Uh, things have changed so phenomenally rapidly, and it's all looped together somehow. This is, this is all being used by them to work on us. Go ahead, Neil. Well, I mean, the the things that's interesting about um, what you just said about the validation—that's that's exactly what it is with with things like Facebook. In it's it's not stupid for people to to like celebrities and to like gossip and to like um, um, hearing about those sort of people. And I'll tell you for why, right? It's social information. It's this is what you sort of hardwired to stare at people who are considered alpha males or successes or you know key figures within the tribe, so to speak. And and this is this is not just you know a social thing. This this is um, you know an instinctual drive as well. In experiments, chimpanzees will happily go without food just to stare at a picture of the dominant male within the tribe, and that's hmm. because basically they can absorb information, information about how that person's got to where they are in, mm -hmm. in, in life mm -hmm. and how they can achieve that by basically being a bit like them, which is almost it's exactly like celebrity endorsement. You know, be like Michael Jordan by wearing his trainers or whatever. Do you know what well, that's, where the, that's where the term to ape something came from. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay, right. Well, Copy there, it. There go, then. Uh, well, yeah, it certainly sounds uh, uh, that way. So because of this, you get a buzz from social information. Now, we've been given this fabulous tool by the lovely, benevolent Mark Zuckerberg um, of Facebook. And uh, uh -huh. in return, in return, for every detail and aspect of your personal existence, you can play this fabulous game. And basically what it is it, akin to, it becomes addictive because it, it's like a gambling machine, essentially. When you, when you put a post up or something like that, you're kind of, you're basically fishing. You're putting down high stakes to see if you get a response. So if you get a response, that's wicked. You've won. You're brilliant. You feel boosted and you feel great. You might even start a conversation or something like that. If you don't, oh, no, that's, that's the worst feeling in the world. Nobody, nobody's responded to my post. So I best post something else. And it is. It's, a, it's basically, it works in the same sense that a Skinner box works, the, the concept of constantly pressing a lever. And... Sometimes you'll get a response and sometimes you won't get a response. And what's bizarre is you'd expect people, if they, you know, I've tried it five times, I've got two responses. You'd expect people to give up, but they don't. They panic and start pressing it at random. That, that's exactly what will happen to, to a rat in a maze. And so they start really fishing for this to desperately, desperately get the results that they were getting before. Now, I'll take that a step further, particularly with Facebook. Um, the problem with Facebook is that what does that tell you? It tells you very soon, subconsciously maybe, but you'll start to notice that some sorts of posts, some sort of uh, things that you say, get more responses than, than other things. Some things will lose your friends. Some things will get you ridiculed or whatever. So what do you do? You start <laughs> to cater your output. Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. What does that tell you? That tells you that the edited, televised, Facebook internet version of you is more popular than you. Exactly. It's certainly got more friends than you. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not really because obviously these, these aren't, this is nonsense. The problem with things like Facebook as well is that they breed narcissism because everybody goes back. You know, studies have actually shown, Harvard studies, very, very eminent studies have shown that basically the, the more, the two things, the more involved in social media that you are, the less socially active you are actually likely to be and the less healthily so socially active you are likely to be. And also the more narcissistic you are likely to be because basically the whole thing is a, is a, it's an internet notice board. You're jumping up and down trying to get attention. 
And that's how it works. I'm not insulting people. I'm saying that this is the drive. This is how clever it is. That's how it sort of encapsulates you and, and, and traps it's you there. It's insidious. And then the worst thing is that basically we've got smartphones, which everybody's on all the time. You know what makes me laugh is like people keep talking about, oh, is there going to be a zombie invasion? Oh, zombies. Look out. Look in the street. There's zombies <laughs> everywhere. They're just phone zombies. <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> and again, there's a, there's a reason for this. And again, very eminent. This might sound nonsensical, but it's true. A very, very eminent study at Harvard basically proved that because of the effectiveness of the advertising campaign, because of the effectiveness of the belief about lifestyle that an iPhone has, and because of the valuable conduit that it is seen to be for providing you all this social information and this uh -huh. fabulous ego-boosting nonsense, people don't just respond to their iPhones in particular as a, an object anymore. They respond to the ringtone or the buzz or the message signal in the same synaptic chemical way that they would respond to seeing a loved one. It's a, it's also, it's a reward. In a yeah, way. but it's not just a reward in a drug sense. You Got know, it. Drugs work in a sense, they'll basically boost your dopamine and stuff like that. What has been proven is because of the the, the connection that people feel to this, and the, basically they feel that this is a complete channel into their existence. My goodness. That, that huh. They're actually falling in love with their phones, physically, chemically. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Crackers. Th this is, uh, oh, it's it, totally crackers. This is very frightening. Uh, in a way, when people become involved in social media, I am not. You create an ideal, desirable version of yourself to become acceptable and to get rewarded. Exactly. It's a drug. It's a drug. You pull, you're yeah. the monkey pulling the lever. You're pulling that lever until you figure out how to get that treat, how to get that reinforcement, how to get to that sense of self-worth that most people are deprived of, I think, with intent by the society, and they're actually driven into, in a herd format, this entire world of Facebook and social media. I remember about a year, year and a half ago, I heard a, a story out of L.A. that in most major cities this was going on, and it was teens, tweens, and preteens whose parents would buy them cell phones. Well, they'd have a, a group, or a, just a, well, a, a group, 10 or 12 of them perhaps, and they at night they were so connected, Neil, and so afraid of being unconnected to their peers, not their parents, not their family, they would go to sleep with their cell phones on and they'd all dial into a group call. So they'd all be connected all night and they'd doze off or they'd wake up and they'd talk to each other and then they'd go back to sleep. And these phones were all night radiating EMF into their brains. This is a, the big fad. Not good. Well, anyway. Weird. Yeah, totally weird. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people might sort of go, oh, it's a bit far-fetched. I'll, I'll give a sort of a practical example of how powerful uh, concepts can be painting pictures in people's head and it's a sort of a tangible thing I remember a few years ago well actually it was a long time ago now it was what was called the cola wars you know there was the pepsi challenge and sure. stuff like that sure. and then coca-cola changed their taste and then changed it back in a completely not a publicity stunt um H well, had me on the it, edge of my chair i'll tell you <laughs> well exactly you know it was it was uh you know who, who couldn't have been but um, there was there was an experiment that was done just to basically see which which was better, like a you know double blind test. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, they discovered that even people that were actually hardcore fanatics, you know, people that were considered fans of the drink, I drink nothing else. Oh no, I'm not drinking Coca Cola. That's terrible. I'm not drinking Pepsi. That's awful. Or whatever. In double blind tests, not a single person could tell the difference. Now. It's not quite as simple as that, because basically they did another test whereby basically there were dr people drinking Coke and images were flashed, uh, uh, or drinking cola, and images were flashed in front of their faces. Now, it transpired that when Coca-Cola logos were flashed up in front of these people, regardless of whether they were Pepsi fans or not, regardless, they felt that the drink tasted nicer, regardless of what the actual drink was. Now, this isn't because the drink they were having was different or more pleasant or in any way had uh, uh, different ingredients to, to the rest of the taste. They were well past the sense of taste. I understand what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. It's the association of Coca-Cola, the brand, 
with what you're doing, that caused a, a, a noticeable and uh, measurable change in brain response to the actual drink. And it caused what is known as a synthesisia, oh, I've probably pronounced it wrong, where your senses are, are mangled. And it, it told their brains that this drink was a tastier and more pleasant drink mm -hmm. because they associated it with the glamorous imagery of Coca-Cola. Now, what does that tell you? It doesn't, all it tells you is that Coca-Cola's marketing campaign is more successful than Pepsi's because the association is that that is the leading brand and therefore we expect it to be good. But again, that is a, that's a classic example of, huh. of third-party advocacy, uh -huh. uh, sloganeering and, and association. They sell everything with sex now. I mean, everywhere you look, there are women. Female, the female form is being used as it has been forever in the media. But now it seems to be more widespread and utterly, it permeates everything. Everything. Well, one thing that, that, that has changed is that, and, it, and again, this depends how devious you want to look at it, is the sexualization of younger and younger kids. And the, what, it, what it seems to be is the sort of, to younger and younger girls specifically, you need to be aware that men are looking at you, guys are looking at you, and so, you know, you need to step up younger and younger and younger. Now, why is that? Is that purely because basically people realize down this is a whole new demographic if we can sell makeup and and you know training bras to four-year-olds then and, and make them feel like you know that they, they, they need to um achieve in the same they, they give them aspirations like at a very young age then basically you know we can we can uh we can sell to them and obviously no, no, you know, kids have got the knack it's factor. Uh, now, much that's darker that's, than that well i i would tend to think this because if it wasn't you know it it's apparent if 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 you and i can look at it and go hang on that's really, really devious, you know. If 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 you know kids are, are sexualized younger and younger and younger, um, surely you know they'll they'll be made to feel pressured into being more adult sooner and sooner, and that causes a whole raft of problems, doesn't it? So if we're smart enough to notice that, hang on, this is perhaps not the best thing to do, then why is it allowed, and why is it you know so? It, is it that the advertising is it Madison Avenue is have got such a powerful grip? Is, is it their pockets are so deeply lined? It's beyond that. It seems to be, does it not? Because it basically, is. as you say, it, it, it is ubiquitous. Um, and then again, I mean, it, you already get into it. I mean, look at the cross-contamination of companies as well. That, that's that's all, always sort of very, very interesting. I mean, an example is somewhere like Time Warner who has, you know, cross-board commitments to weapons companies. Um, and that's oh, it's, say, go, they're all they're all in so the same what? kettle. They're all in the same of kettle. And, and but, but I, how does that affect people? Well, that affects people in a way where, whereby basically an artist who's on a, a record label that's associated with Time Warner or mm -hmm. Time Warner is the conglomerate parent company of that, mm -hmm. you will not be allowed to do anything that is is considered detrimental to the shareholders of the other companies like Lockheed Martin or weapons companies mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. whatever companies might be connected at a board level. For two reasons. One, because he's bad business, and two, because he's actually illegal. It's illegal for, for people to do anything that, that is... For, it is illegal for a board to approve something that they know will ruin the share price. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that's really strange because... You know, I mean, I, this might be my blinkered and simplistic view of it, but I was thinking about that. So what about, say, electricity companies? If they lowered the price of their units for sale, you know, how much it costs for your electricity bill, surely that's detrimental to the shareholders. So does that not put companies in a, a position whereby they're not actually allowed to benefit their customers? Uh, very few are. Absolutely oh, correct. 100% correct. And if I might say one other thing about the sexualization of young children, uh, we have to mention that in a number of venues around the world, the Western world, uh, pedophilia is now being pushed as just another lifestyle choice. 